if, you're, if you want to play along on your laptops. Are we? All right, let's begin. So this is Swift 102 extensibility and what you can do with it with OpenStack Swift. Uh, I'm Doug Soltes. I work for a company, uh, SwiftStack. We're the leading contributor to OpenStack Swift. And um, today I'd like to tell you a little bit more about some of the more advanced functions that Swift has beyond just create, write, updates, deletes. So the first question is, are you in the right session? Uh, if you're here, I do hope that you already know what an object is, and I hope you know that objects can be accessed through a REST API. And so then we're going to move on quickly through those. Now, if you don't know those, we will cover it. But we're going to move on to what middleware is. We're going to outline the functions that exist in middleware. And we're going to actually start talking about examples for applications or uh, use cases for some of the middleware that exists today before we, we let you go out and build your own middleware, hopefully. So again, quick recap, Swift 101. What is an object? An object's really simple. It's a file that we're going to upload via the HTTP protocol. You can access it via REST API. And the unique thing is we're going to associate some metadata with it. And so in this example of the Golden Gate Bridge, um, here's some metadata that you may want to associate with this image. How are objects accessed? Well, what most people do when they use a Swift object store is they create an object, so they put, then they get it many times, and eventually they probably delete that object. And so these are your basic uh, CRUD commands, as you call it. Um, you can do the same thing for the metadata associated with the object. And today, what we want to do, just like there was a talk earlier this week, is move on beyond the, the basic commands uh, that CRUD's going to give you. If you're still fuzzy on Swift 101, I highly recommend that you stop by the SwiftStack booth. They are giving out the OpenStack Swift O'Reilly Animal Book, um, as well as the OpenStack website has uh, a lot of great resources and tools for Swift. And the Swift 101 presentation has been given here at the Vancouver OpenStack Summit, as well as the video is available already online for the Atlanta and for the Paris Summit. So let's start off with what is middleware. Well, Swift has this thing called a pipeline. And a pipeline is when you, is a Python construct, and it allows you to intercept requests or responses, and if needed, to make alterations to those events. And so if you think about Super Mario here, he's about to go into the pipeline, and at each of these own orange points, something could happen. So maybe he'll be routed to the right or the left or up. Maybe you have to do something on your controller. But in the Swift pipeline, we're going to let middleware look at what you've sent and alter, possibly, if you decide you wanted to, what was sent to the, the Swift backend system. And that can happen again on ingest or egest. So without middleware, this is what most people are doing today, even though middleware ships right in OpenStack Swift when you download it. You're going to have a client. They're going to access the proxy. They're probably going to put some data. They're going to request some data. They're going to delete some data. It's kind of boring. It goes straight to the storage node. With middleware, we can inject at both the proxy and the storage node anything we want. We can alter your data. We can concatenate your data. We can convert it if it's a genomic sequence from a compressed file to an uncompressed file. We can index it. There's a lot of neat things we can do with middleware. So what middleware exists today? Well, here's just a small subset of what ships with OpenStack Swift. It's already baked in. And of course, you can write your own middleware, and we'll get to that. And you can really build it to do anything you want. And if you want to know even more about middleware, I would recommend that you go watch the Paris Summit. There was a Swift 102. Uh, extensibility in OpenStack by John Dickinson. He's the Swift project technical lead. And he really went through, here are all the different ones that, that exist today. And he talked about um, you know, how you can get involved. But I want to get down to a different business. I don't want to tell you what it does. I want to tell you how to use it. And so I've highlighted a couple of key middleware features that on a daily basis I'm asked about, whether that's by you know, end users, app owners, um, or project developers. 
And so we're going to go through a couple of examples today on how to check the proxy status, how to authenticate, how to do range reads, bulk uploads, a lot of really nice functions and features. And again, there's some uh, associated code examples um, with this that you can follow along with if you download the deck. So the first thing I want to do is I want to talk about a Swift middleware implementation called Health Check. And what Health Check does is it's really simple. It lets you know if a proxy node is up or down. So normally, you're going to put a load balancer in front of your Swift cluster. And your load balancer, whether that's an F5 or, or uh, you know, a Netscaler, you're going to write some complicated script or logic to do something like try a put every 30 seconds, try a get every 30 seconds. And based on the response you get, you'll make an evaluation as to whether or not the system's up or down. But with health check, it's nice and easy. We're going to go to a single address. And if the node's working properly, it's going to respond OK. And if not, you're not going to get a response. And that's going to really help when we start talking about rolling upgrades in Swift. Because Swift is this huge distributed platform that should have no downtime and should be able to mitigate around failure. And so what better way than if either a node fails and it does not give you that OK request, meaning that one of its services is not working right, or B, if you're actually intending to do an update, the node would stop re accepting all new requests. And after it stopped accepting new requests, it wouldn't take any new ones. And it would change its status from OK to not OK to notify the load balancer that it's not ready to take a response. And so this is probably the most simple way that you can use this piece of middleware. If you go to any Swift proxy node slash health check, you should get a return of OK. And you can try that right now by opening up your web browser to HTTP or HTTPS and hitting a Swift node, and you should get the very exciting OK message back. But there's more we can do. So that's probably the easiest example. One of the questions I get asked all the time is, well, Swift has all these great features. In fact, if you went to an earlier talk by John Dickinson, uh, it was Swift Beyond Crud. He talked about temporals, and he talked about form posts, and he talked about all these neat things that a Swift cluster can do. But that's set up by your Swift admin. So if you're a developer or you're an end user, how do you know what your admin has enabled? How do you know what the max size of an object you can put out there is? We've talked a lot in the past Swift events about storage policies that was new out last year. How do you know what the name of those storage policies are? I get this question all the time. So there's another piece of middleware, again, that ships by default in OpenStack Swift, and it's called Info. And here's just a subset of things that you can get from it. So if you go to your cluster and you go to slash info, you're going to get a JSON response back that's going to look like this. Now, I know that this is a bit of a uh, eye chart. So what I've done is I've highlighted two examples that I probably get asked about the most. So if you go to your Swift cluster, and again, you go to slash info, you're going to get a JSON response. And, and does that green show up well? You're going to get a JSON response. And it's actually a dictionary of dictionaries. And inside of it, if you wanted to know what your storage policies were, here it is, policies. There are two of them. There's one called standard replica on this cluster. There's one called EC on this cluster. And this is the default. Later on in my talk, we're going to talk about uh, static large objects. And so one thing that's very helpful if you're using static large objects is to know what is the maximum amount of segments I can put into my static large object? Or what is the minimum size of each segment in my static large object? So again, without picking up the phone and actually calling your Swift storage admin, or if you're using a cloud compute cluster such as um, IBM SoftLayer, you can easily ascertain this information. Authentication is something that's really important to any step storage platform. And what a lot of people forget is that this is part of middleware as well. So by default, Swift ships with temp auth. And temp auth is the version one authentication. And it's really insecure. It stores all of your passwords in an unencrypted file on the Swift cluster. However, if you have Keystone, you can use V2 authentication. And again, through middleware, you'll be able to authenticate. Well, what if you want to use LDAP or Active Directory? What if you wanted to use something local to the Swift cluster, like TempAuth, that was secure? Well, a number of firms out there have written additional middleware that you can license or plug in, or you could write your own to enable these features. In fact, yesterday, or not yesterday, but on Monday at the keynote, there was a whole presentation on the federated um, keystone. And so wouldn't it be great if the next middleware piece written for authentication was the uh, federated keystone? 
So if you want to authenticate, and you're going to need this information if you follow along at home with some of my future slides, it's pretty simple. You're going to send a username and a password to your Swift cluster to an authentication URL, and you're going to get a response, and that response is going to have two things. The token, which is good for a certain amount of time to access the data, and you're also going to get your Swift storage URL. And when you see my future examples, the Swift storage URL I reference as dollar sign SURL, and the token I, I reference as dollar sign token. So let's get into some more advanced features. So those are like really, really basic ones, but extremely helpful. So Swift has the ability to do versioning through middleware. And so why would you want to do versioning through middleware? Well, let's say that you have a container and you're using a system like Cyberduck or Expand Drive or uh, Cloudberry, and you're consuming Swift natively with your laptop. And for me, I'm writing this presentation, Swift 102. So I have a container, and so in Swift we call them containers, and that's where we're storing our data instead of a directory. And I'm putting my document into there, and then my documents, every time I overwrite it, ends up in another container called presentations underscore old, and there's nothing unique about these names. I could have called them whatever I wanted, and it's going to save each Swift document. And if I was to delete the newest version from presentations, presentations old would take the most recent version and return it back. So if you work with something like uh, a storage made easy or another file sync and share system, and your users want versioning, there's no reason for you to write your own versioning. It's already baked into OpenStack Swift. And if you want to enable it, it's actually pretty simple. There is one line that you would need to set in your server configuration file. And then all you need to do is, in this example, we build two containers. And then I post to one of the containers with a header, so this is my metadata, x versions location, my files versions. So essentially, I'm telling my files that whenever a object is replaced, it should take the older version and put it into this container. Here's a further example of actually using this code, again, if you want to try against one of your own systems. Another extremely useful feature in middleware that you can enable by default is called object expiration. And so what this does is I put an object into my container, and I'm going to set one of two header flags on it. I'm either going to do, we'll start with the easier one, x delete after, and in this example, that's seconds, so 45 seconds. So if I put a document into this container, 45 seconds later, it will self-destruct. It will delete. Now, does it really delete? Well, no, but what happens is middleware, remember we can do this on the request or on the response. If you request this object and it has not been deleted by the auditor, middleware will check to see that it should be deleted and will return you a 404. Now, likewise, there's another extremely useful command that you can use with object expiration, and that's at, uh, x delete at, and that's epoch time. So if you wanted every single object in a container to be deleted on January 1st, 2017, you could set the epoch time of January 1st, 2017, and that entire container would become unavailable, all the objects in it. So where is this useful? Well, this is really useful when you're using Swift as scratch space. So imagine you're a genomics lab, and you have a sequencer, and it's sequencing everybody in this room's DNA, and it's putting it all into a container. And then from there, we're going to have our HPC unit read that data, manipulate it, align it, and produce a final outcome. Well, all the data that we had in this scratch container is not really very relevant once I actually have the end data. And so instead of writing another program that goes, you know what, after 30 days, I'm going to go back and I'm going to delete this whole room worth of people, their scratch data, and that can be very time consuming. Why don't we just let the Swift cluster take care of it for us? And that way, you're not wasting time and compute on a client node or worrying about um, really anything. Let the system take care of it for you. So here's a, a, a quick little example. And again, all you need to do is when you put or post the object. So if you put an object, you can put the header on it. Or if you have an existing object, you can add this header to its metadata. And it's um, x delete after 45. That's going to delete it in 45 seconds. You'll see that what Swift does is actually middleware converts it to the x delete at, which is your epoch time. 
and after that time, you won't be able to get your file back. Now, in this example, I play along with my previous slide of versioning, and so I actually wrote three different versions of a file to one container, and then one of them I tagged with the delete after 45 seconds, and believe it or not, you can chain middleware together, as we talked about in that pipeline, and so I actually get the previous version. So they can trigger off of each other, just like Super Mario going through that pipeline. Another great feature that people ask for all the time and is available, has been available in Swift forever, is a range read. So when you put an object into the system, you put the whole object in. And if you do a git, you're going to get the entire object back. Well, that's not always useful. What if I'm a media company? What if I'm Digital Film Tree? They were up on stage. He very much said, hey, we're taking Aspera. We're writing this to our Swift backend. They use Swift, a ton of Swift at Digital Film Tree. And now we're going to edit that video. I don't want to pull that entire file back. I just want a small subset of that data. So in this example, you could take War and Peace. You could upload the entire thing to the Swift cluster. And then you can send a range and say, I just want the first 100 bytes, bytes 0 to 100. And this is actually, I downloaded War and Peace, the first 100 bytes of War and Peace. Likewise, you can actually give it multiple ranges. You could say, I want byte range 0 to 100, comma, I want a million to a billion, and it will send you a mime part back with both those byte ranges. You can also do this where you can say, I want minus a million, and it'll send you just the first meg of the file. This is really useful also when we're talking about backup data. If you backed up your entire Mac hard drive, and your Mac is 100 gigs, and you only want one file back, a range read is a much more efficient way to get that back than pulling back that entire object. Again, we have a little bit of code here to show you how it can be done and with a uh, multiple range read. Server-side copy. This is another great feature. So I've got my Swift cluster. It's up in the cloud. I'm using, let's say, IBM SoftLayer or another great provider out there. And I've sent my data over to my container. And then I decide, ah, I want to do some modifications to it. I want to copy it over to another container. Why do I want to copy it to another container? Well, Swift just came out with this thing called erasure coding. So maybe the previous container I put it in was set for replicas, and the new container is set for erasure coding. And maybe after a certain amount of time, I want to move my documents from being replicated to being erasure coded. Well, the only way to do that is to put it into the new container. So you could request the object, pull it back, waste that bandwidth, send it back over the line, or you could just tell Swift, hey, do a server-side copy. Copy War and Peace from the green container and put it in the red container. And again, each of those could have totally different characteristics for the containers. Or, as we know, an object should be immutable. When I put an object up on the system, I don't want to be changing that object. If I change the object, it's now technically a new version. And if I don't have versioning enabled, then I'm not going to be keeping my old versions. And so what if you wanted to rename warnpeace.doc to warnpeace.old? Well, you could give it a server-side copy. And again, without wasting any bandwidth, instantly you're going to have a new copy. And then you could just send your delete command. Now, server-side copy is another one of these things that we can combine in middleware. So in my example, I try to give you another fun one. I've got my example combined with a range request. So there's nothing wrong with saying, I don't want to copy the entire war and piece. I just want to take the first chapter and copy it to a new object. Again, middleware can be chained together. This is a really good function, again, to save you bandwidth and to save you time. So when you upload a lot of small objects, you're opening and closing, opening and closing HTTP um, channels. And so what if I could tar a bunch of files together and send them in one bunch and then let the proxy layer break them apart and save them as individual objects on the storage layer? Because at the end of the day, this is what I want in the storage layer, but if these are docs in, in this presentation I've got right here, maybe they zip up really well. So I can use gzip or bzip2, and I can tar these together and zip them. I can do what's called a bulk upload in Swift to my container. My container happens to be called presentations. And Swift will take care of unzipping everything and storing them as their native documents. 
And I was talking to a developer last night at dinner, and he said, hey, even new in Swift, and I don't actually have the example for this because this was at dinner last night, he said, if you zip these up and you tell tar to take the extended attributes, and those extended attributes for these files happen to have metadata, then these objects will also have that metadata through this process. And so again, here is an uh, example of how you can do this if you leave this and want to try it at home. All right, so let's get into some of the ones that people use the most. And so large objects. So when you go to a Swift 101 talk, they tell you the biggest object you can have is the size of the entire Swift cluster. I've got a petabyte Swift cluster. I could put a petabyte file in there. But it's a little deceptive. They should say you can put a petabyte file in there. They shouldn't say you can put a petabyte object in there. Because an object can be a collection, I'm sorry, a file can be a collection of many objects chained together. And why would you want to do this? Well, for one, by default, Swift is set to a five gig limit per object. So you can't put an object into Swift bigger than five gigs. And if you want to know what your current cluster is set at, remember, use middleware and go back to slash info, and you can get that information. But why else would you not want to put a five gig object or a bunch of five gig objects into your Swift cluster? Well, it doesn't give you very good distribution of your data. So if you've got 100 disk, and you're putting small objects on them, and you're putting big objects on them, you may see imbalances because Swift is going to divide everything up as unique as possible, but not based on the actual size of the object. And so you would get better throughput to break that 5 gig object maybe into 100 individual segments. You'll get better throughput, too, of sending those up. But now that I have that one 5 gig object broken into 100 little segments, how do I stitch them all back together? And that's what we're going to talk about. So the first way is through something called static large objects. And so a static large object is kind of special. It supports range reads. So again, if I've got that giant movie file and I upload it, and the use case is that I do want to seek within it, or a backup, and it's a terabyte backup, and I do want to seek within it, it's really important that I create a static large object and not what we'll talk about next, which is a dynamic large object. Static large objects can use objects across multiple containers. So I can create this, this instruction, what we call the manifest. So if you think about this like Legos, if these are all my objects, I'm going to create a single file that tells you how to reassemble them into my static large object. And by doing that, I'm able to still support um, range reads. Now, by default, your minimum segment size, so each of these objects has to be a megabyte. But again, if you need to know what your cluster is set at, go to slash info. The other great thing about static large objects is that when you send it up as a static large object, it has a list of the E tags and the size of every object that is expected to reassemble the static large object. And if one of those goes corrupt or missing, then we can return that the entire static large object is corrupt. And lastly, and this is probably the, the best benefit of all, is deduplication. So let's go back to our movie example. So I just uploaded Star Wars Episode Seven. And there's a scene of Han Solo in it. But Harrison Ford says, nah, my hair looks too gray. You know, change it. So I've got my movie up there. I've uploaded the whole thing. I do my range read. I get the, the segment where Harrison's Ford is a little too gray. And I do my movie magic, and I change it. So now I upload that segment again. But I want to have the original because we're Hollywood. We never want to alter the original. So instead of uploading the whole movie, I simply give that one object back up there, and I create a new SLO, a new manifest, a new instruction. And I reference all of the previous objects that I put up there, except for the one where Harrison's For Harrison Ford's hair is a little bit too gray. And so when you think about it that way, it gives you deduplication. You could use this in backups as well. If you're deduplicating your backup, your file system, into 4K chunks, build a static large object, and then when that changes, build a new static large object, only referencing the objects that changed. Here's a little bit of code. So this is what a manifest would look like. Again, you reference the container in the object. You have to give it the E tag, and you have to give it the size and bytes so that we can ensure that you're getting the right object, and we can give you that range readability. 
let's talk about dynamic large objects. Now, I see a lot of people using dynamic large objects when they should use static large objects. And the reason is simple. It's pretty easy to use a dynamic large object. A dynamic large object can only be within a single container. And what it does is it sets a prefix. So imagine I have a logging machine. So my, SIF, my Swift cluster is logging every single access. I've got middleware that tells it, send this all out to a file, swiftlog.txt. But what I do is by time of day, every hour, I'm rotating this log. So my log system saving these files, Swift log text 01, 02, 03, 04, into this container. I can create a DLO, and all I have to do is give it swift.log.txt, and then anything that, uh, this is my prefix, anything continuing on from that in alphabetical order, if I was to request this object, I will get the sole concatenation of all of the pieces together. This is also really important if you have a video system. So maybe you bought one of those cameras online and it's monitoring your house, but you tell it only record when I see motion. And when you tell it to record when you see motion, you tell it to save the file with time of day, and then you set a prefix for the actual time of day, and now you can watch all the motion from the day without having to open each individual object one by one. Here's again how you would create a static large object. In this case, it would be anything in the container that starts the, an object that starts with SEG would appear as a single object. And again, when you retrieve it, you retrieve it like you would any other object. Middleware gets in there, sees what you're trying to do, and returns the user what the user wants without them knowing about any of this. So I don't like it when a talk ends and they go, well, now that you know this, go out there and build something. Well, what's something? I've given you use cases and examples of what you can build. But when I meet with um, you know, groups like you that say, I want to use middleware, I commonly hear new use cases every day. So these are just a few that I've heard this week at this event. So yesterday there was a talk by um, Hudson Alpha, and they talked about genomics. And he said in that talk, I would really like middleware that takes a BAM file, which is a compressed file and aligned of your genomics, and converts it on the fly to a unaligned, uncompressed file, because that's sometimes more useful to me. And I don't want to store both in Swift. I only want to store the BAM file. But when I request it, I want to give a header that uncompresses it. Likewise, you can do a bolt delete. I didn't spend time on it, but that's another piece of middleware. And if you want to do a bulk delete on something like everything that starts with SEG star, you can't do that. You have to do two commands. First, you would query the system and ask for a list of everything that's SEG star. And then you would turn, return that to the Swift system in a bulk delete command. Well, what if I wanted to do that in just one command? It'd be easy. We could string those two together. Or I heard another one, and again, from the genomics folks. What if every time I put an object into the Swift cluster and it has metadata, I take that metadata and I send it over to another system? Maybe it's an Elasticsearch. Maybe that metadata is a MySQL database, because that's what people want to query. And so the sky is the limit if you can think of what you want to build, or just talk to other people, and they'll tell you what to build. Now, I forgot one thing. I forgot to tell you how to build middleware. I told you about middleware that exists today, and I told you about how to use it. but. There's a video for that, too. So back in Atlanta, Christian from eNovance uh, did a Swift talk on how to build middleware. And during the talk, he sat right down, and he started coding middleware. He has a full slide deck. It's all available online if you cho so choose to go out and develop your own middleware. But otherwise, I hope that I've enabled you to take advantage of some of the neat functions that currently exist in middleware beyond create, retrieve, update, and delete. So if you're inspired to do more and you want to try this on your laptop right now, you can go out and get Swift All-in-One. It's a little developer VM that you can set up on your laptop. You can go to the Swift um, OpenStack website, and you could set up an entire Swift cluster. Or the company that I work for, uh, SwiftStack, actually makes it really simple. They put a whole management piece on it. You put, throw some commodity hardware at the Swift controller, 
and it sets the whole thing up in a nice, easy Swift cluster. So you can just get down to business of actually using Swift, building applications, or enabling your users with a backup program, a genomics project. So that's pretty much it. If there are any questions, I'd be glad to take them now. And again, this slide deck is available if you go to at Doug Soltes um, on Twitter. I tweeted out this morning. If you guys want, I can rewind to the very first slide. I had a, a, a shortened link that you can pull it from, and it will be available after the event. Any questions? Um, question on middleware. What limitations do you have? I mean, are there examples of the kinds of things you can't or won't want to build as middleware? I mean, one example that I can think of that I'm not sure you can is, for instance, I notify, the equivalent of I notify for Swift. So, middleware is going to run in Python for right now. And there, there used to be zero VM, which was a way to, to call middleware out to another function. Now, at the IBM talk, there was uh, last, I'm sorry, in Paris, IBM gave a speech on something they called storelets, and that's another type of middleware that you can enable for OpenStack Swift. So some bad examples would be something that's really processor intense. So you're going to be doing this computation in middleware on your Swift node. So let's say I have that video file, and the thing I need to do is transcode it. That would probably be a bad idea, whereas unzipping a, a genomics file wouldn't be such a bad idea. If I wanted to do that, I would probably use something like the IBM Storelet middleware to ship that off to a separate compute node or uh, like an HPC cluster and bring that back. So what you want to do is you want to be responsible and not take your proxy and hammer it at 100% CPU. Because if you do, because of the middleware that you write, you can either break the pipeline or make the entire environment unresponsive for other people. Does that help? Sure. So let me just repeat the question. So the question was, uh, with the object expiration, I mentioned that that doesn't actually delete it. What it does is it gives you a 404. You're unable to get the data back. So when does it get deleted? Well, Swift has this thing called the auditor, and it's constantly walking the system. And what it does is it opens a, an object. It checks the um, hash of it. It compares it against the e-tag. And it makes sure that the object hasn't been corrupted. And if it has, it puts it in the quarantine. And then through either erasure coding or replicas, we're going to repair it. So with the object expiration, that's middleware that makes the object unavailable to you. But when the auditor hits it, the middleware will kick in and tell the auditor, please delete that object. Depending on your cluster and how long it takes to walk it could affect how long it takes to free up the, to actually get the space back in the Swift cluster question on versioning. So when you're creating a version copy, is it just doing a diff copy or is it doing a full copy? It's doing a full copy. So if we go to the actual code example there, yeah, it would be nice or neat if somebody wrote some middleware that did a diff copy like subversion or, or something else would. Um, object expiration versioning. These are what your versions will actually look like, and they are the full previous object. So essentially what versioning is doing is an automated server-side copy, right? So we talked about server-side copy. Now some other things you could do with versioning is a trash can. Think about an undelete trash can. You have a container, and you don't really want versioning, but you want every time somebody, you do want versioning, but you also want every time somebody deletes an object, instead of it being deleted, it still goes to the version folder or container, and nobody else has access to that except for the admin. And maybe you set everything in the version folder to automatically expire after 180 days. So now you've protected yourself a little bit against that rogue user that might get angry at the company and try to delete an entire Swift container. You can pull everything back. So again, you can string things together. But to the point, this does not dedupe. This does not diff the file. Any other questions? I'm told we have five minutes left. I'll go back to the first slide if anybody wants the, the link to download. Just a clarification question. Oh, I'm sorry. You're using 
the term containers. That's a different term than the other containers, like a Docker container, correct? Yes. Could you clarify that? So if you deal with Amazon and S3, they use something called a bucket. Swift uses something called a container. Think of a container like a directory with a database associated to it. It has nothing to do with Docker containers, which is a, a different space for actually um, running your code that's isolated at a kernel level. What this is is um, Swift implements a MySQL database per container, which is like a directory, and that's where we're holding the metadata. So when you write your object, you get quorum, and if that's erasure coding, that's all of the data pieces plus one parity, or if it's the uh, replica, it's half the replicas plus one. And so you're going to get a uh, return that, that you're okay. It then goes and updates a database, a MySQL, uh, I'm sorry, a SQLite database, and so that when you want to list a directory or a container, it's responsive, it can sort, it can do all the things that a database is very good at. So in the context that I'm speaking a container, that's a swift term for um, basically a database-enabled metadata data, uh, directory. Anyone else? Would uh, middleware be a, a good place to put something that would synchronize Swift objects to another file system type like HDFS? Yeah, so uh, another great use case that I've heard. So the question was, is, is middleware um, another enabling feature to, to sync things between different file systems? So file systems have things like extended attributes. Or if you're working in a file system, and let's say we're, we're using some sort of Linux file system, you've got user IDs. And those user IDs aren't federated between different groups. Well, what if you created a... Um, when you ingested an object, you tagged the metadata for the user ID. Let's say I'm, I'm at a certain university, University of Madison, Wisconsin. I tag my user ID. I also create a database out there of all the user IDs, a federated database of user IDs in, in, from all the different schools. And then you use middleware to look up and translate when you're on, say, Internet 2 and have all these different HPC clusters working on different people's data so that all the permissions and everything flows really properly. So a very good question. All right, well, I thank everyone for their time, and I hope you learned something.